And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of... The Dance of the Devil Dogs. Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. There's something strange about this whole setup. I don't know. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Dance of the Devil Dolls. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Have you heard of avutamo? Literally, the word means face image. The practice of avutamo is as ancient as Egypt and Assyria, and still found from Ceylon to the United States, Europe to Africa, South America to Scandinavia. A figure is made to resemble that of a hated enemy, then methodically injured or destroyed, resulting in pain and death for its human counterpart. Charles and I had gone up for a weekend of fishing. Saturday night at dusk, when the sky had dulled from blue to gray, and the gray was shading darker every minute, we were walking back up to the cabin. Not a bad haul, huh, Emery? For you, not for me. I'll bet you the smallest of those three bass weighs over four pounds. What bait were you using? A well, spoon. The fish just wouldn't leave it alone. Anyway, we'll have a good fish dinner tonight. And maybe tomorrow my luck will change. Well, I hope so. What time is it? About nine. We've been out five hours. Chuck. Yeah? There's someone coming down the trail towards us. Where? Oh, yes, I see. You can't be going down to fish this late. Oh, we can't tell. Some guys really get the bug. There's a guy I know named Lloyd Erskine who will fish Excuse off... Excuse me, gentlemen. He means us. I wonder what he wants. Excuse me, gentlemen. I lost something. I wonder if you found it. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for, mister, but we haven't found it, whatever it is. Perhaps you saw it lying on the ground. It was a doll. A doll? Yes, about 12 inches tall. It looks something like... like me. I'm sorry, we haven't seen it. Of course you can always buy your daughter... It an... doesn't belong to my daughter. Oh. Well, we haven't seen it. Are you staying at a cabin on this lake? Yes. Only until tomorrow night. It's right at the head of the trail up there. You must have passed it as you started down. If by any chance you do come across it, I'll stop in before I leave this area, if you don't mind. Well, that's perfectly all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Well, what do you make of that? Search me. He talks so strangely. I must have the doll for the dance tonight, or the old woman will be angry. <laughs> I think he's off his rocker. Well, it's not our worry, Emery. Come on, let's go. We went back up to our cabin, cleaned the fish, and had one of those fish dinners you talk about for years. It was about 11 o'clock, and we'd started to go to bed, intending to get up as early as possible the next morning when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in? Of course. I see you found the doll. Yes. I wanted to let you know that I had. Well, thanks for telling us. Now I must take him to the dance. Well, the dance ought to be just about over. Oh, no, it, it hasn't begun yet. Well, you'd better get there or your wife will be angry. You misunderstood me. I said the old woman, not my wife. You see, I'm not married. 
Oh. I hope you'll forgive me. I see that you're just about ready to retire, but I am afraid. Afraid? Of what? The old woman is already angry with me. I told her I'd lost the doll, and she swore that if I didn't find it, she'd kill me. That's why I've come to you. If you hear that I'm dead tomorrow, that I committed suicide, you'll know it's not the truth. If I could only get in touch with Dr. George Coltman, he could help, but I'm caught up in something I can't stop, and it's too late to get out now. I've tried to... Oh! Oh! My head! You dropped your doll. I didn't drop it. She caused it to move. She doesn't want me to talk. I've said too much already. I must go now. Here's your doll. Thank you. Remember what I told you. If I'm dead tomorrow, it's murder. Good night, gentlemen. After he dropped the doll. Did you get a good look at him, Chuck? Yeah. The doll hit the floor on its forehead. A few seconds later, there was a heavy bruise on the right side of his forehead. You know, he said if he was found dead tomorrow, that it would be murder. It was about 11.30 when we finally got to bed. We'd opened the windows of the cabin. The sound of the alarm clock we brought with us mingled with that of the crickets outside. I heard something. I didn't know what it was. It sounded strangely like words, but they were uttered in a voice so tiny and shrill that I thought I was imagining things. But then, I heard his voice. No! No, I won't die! They will help me! Emery, I didn't know you were awake. I couldn't sleep. I thought I heard a tiny little voice. I thought... Be quiet! Hey, go! Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I had retired for the night, but neither of us could sleep. Suddenly from outside, we heard the voice of the man we'd met earlier, and another voice, high and shrill, and somehow deadly. out there. We'd better take a look. This is a pair of pants and some shoes, huh? Remember what he said about dying? Yeah. You ready? Yes. All right, let's go. I'm beginning to think that guy belongs in an institution. Maybe. Maybe not. I think a scream came from the left. We'll take a look over there, then. He didn't tell us his name, did he? No. Well, I'll try calling him. Anybody out here? Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. Something strange about this whole setup. I don't know it. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. That little doll that looks so much like him. I don't see it any way around. Neither do I. You know, Chuck, it sounds crazy to say it. That shrill, high little voice we heard. You're letting this thing run wild with your imagination, Emery. Even though it looked like him, it's just a doll, nothing else. It had to be my imagination, of that I was sure. But the mere thought of it, of the doll which so resembled the man with its shining face and beady little eyes, caused a strange sense of apprehension and fear to come across me. And I glanced out into the darkness and saw only the lumbering shadows of the trees and heard the rustle of their leaves as they brushed together. I saw nothing. Yet I had the feeling that something with deedy little eyes was watching us. We notified the authorities. They came out, found no evidence of foul play, and diagnosed his death as being caused by heart failure. Our luck was exceptionally bad out on the lake Sunday, and we drove home that night, speaking but little, thinking only of what had happened the night before.
About ten days after we returned to the city, both Charles and I were home one evening. We shared an apartment together, and that night neither of us had anything to do. We were playing gin rummy. One more hand like that and you'll be out, you lucky dog. It was pure skill, my friend. No luck involved. Cut. No, I trust you. It's a good thing Pamela stood you up tonight. She knew that you wanted a gin partner. <laughs> Don't be humorous. Proposed to her yet? No, but I'm uh, working on it. You know, you deal like a card shark. I have nothing but... Expecting anyone? No, you. Mm -mm. Well, I'll see who it is. Whoever it is, get rid of him. I got a good hand. Coming right up. Is this the residence of Mr. Emery Ryerson and Mr. Charles Hunter? Yes, it is, but... I have a package for you. Are you expecting a package, Emery? Just bills, no packages. It's for both of you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. And good evening, sir. Oh, yes, yes, good evening. There's an old woman. She had a package for us. Well, set it down on the table and open it, man. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I'll open it. Oh, it's wrapped very well. Maybe it's a bottle of scotch. Who is be sending us a bottle of... Someone has a real fine sense of humor. It's like the doll that fellow had with him. It's the same doll. Notice that little nick out of its forehead? That happened when he dropped it on the floor. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. We can keep it, I suppose. Well, let's get back to the game. No, I'm not in the mood now. You know, Emory, I can't help but remember what he said. The man who died? Yes. He said, I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Yes, that's right. What brought that back to your mind? The woman who delivered this package. We put the lid back on the box and left it on the kitchen table with the cards we'd been using. Neither of us entered the kitchen again that evening. We went to bed a short time after 12. Again, I was restless and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling I'd had that night in the cabin. And I remembered the words I'd heard spoken in that unearthly little voice. The old woman will take care of them, too. And I wondered if I'd only imagined those words, or whether they had actually been uttered by the creature in the box in the other room. It was then I heard it, like a thin, reedy piping. It sounded like music, a rhythmic, discordant melody I'd never heard before. And then, I heard another sound. Henry? Yes? Am I going crazy? I hear it, too. I think we'd better see what it is. All right. I don't like this, Henry. It sounds I like... I like what it sounds like. Emery! I can't believe my eyes. The box is open. And the little doll, Emery. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I couldn't believe our eyes, for the scene before us was as bizarre and fantastic as the wildest dream of an insane imagination. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Yes, I see it. This is something that... I'm going to destroy that thing. Be careful. Look out, Chuck. It's running. I'm going to get it if it's the last thing I do. It's running over toward the window. It's gone. It's gone through the glass. Maybe it's down there on the sidewalk. It's possible, but that's a two-story drop. I can't see it. No, Emery. It's gone. They turned again to the old woman. The man who had died had mentioned a name that night in the cabin. The name of Dr. George Kaltman. Now it came back into my mind. Kaltman was associated with occult research. If Kaltman could have helped the man who died, perhaps he could explain what was happening to us. We got in touch with him and made an appointment for the following evening. 
You have told me everything that has happened. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, everything. We'd like to know what it all means. Well, I shall explain it to you as best I can. Have either of you ever heard of envoûtement? No. Not that I recall. Well, envoûtement is the practice of making little dolls to resemble a hated enemy and then methodically injuring or destroying it, thus bringing about either pain or death or both in the doll's human counterpart. Dr. Colton, this doll we saw last night, it, it moved, it danced. I know. What you witnessed last night was the dance of the devil dolls. You say these dolls bring about pain or death, Dr. Colton. Why should we be singled out? The man who died told you about the old woman. Is that not correct? Yes. Therefore, you must be destroyed. She feels that you are dangerous to her, that you know too much. Undoubtedly, the woman you saw last night, Mr. Hunter, was the manipulator, controller of the little figures. Since you saw her, she has probably made little figures of both of you. But before it will live and be subject to her will, she must have a part of you, a lock of your hair, a fingernail clipping, anything that will make yours and the doll's identity one and the same. What should we do? Go back to your apartment. I shall return with you. She will send the little doll back to your apartment tonight. I'm sure of that. We must capture the doll, for it is the only thing that will lead us to her. Kaufman, Charles, and I returned to our apartment and took up our vigil in the bedroom, for that was the place the doll and the old woman would expect us to be. We made dummies of the extra blankets and arranged the beds so it looked as if we were sleeping. You left the apartment door unlocked? Yes. But why? It only makes it easier for it to enter. See, it is what we must do. One way or the other, the doll would find means of entrance. If not tonight, then another. You have no idea what those little creatures are capable of. Listen. It is coming. Be quiet. Wait. Until it is in here. Then close the bedroom door and put on the lights. We understand. Now, quiet. Now! Catch it, quickly! There it is, over there! <laughs> this time it won't get away. Don't let it get near the window! I've got it, I've got it! Quickly, put it in here! <laughs> ah, there. We have it. Now... Ah. What do we do? The star will lead us to the doll woman. You mean now? Tonight? Yes, Mr. Ryerson. She will know that we have captured her little messenger if it does not return in a few hours, and she will be prepared to stop us. We must find her, destroy her if need be, before she has a chance to destroy you. Then began one of the strangest sights I've ever seen. Kaltman took the doll out of the box in which we'd imprisoned it, tied its arms and legs while it writhed and twisted in his hand. Then he began speaking to it, softly, rhythmically, slowly putting it into a hypnotized sleep. The eyelids of the little figure finally closed, and it was in an hypnotic trance. Sleep and tell me. Now, listen to me. You must tell me where your mistress is. You must tell me where your mistress is. The house. The house of dolls. The house of dolls. That's a strange answer. Not so strange, my friends. I know what it means. What is it? She's a diabolical person, this doll woman. The house of dolls is a toy shop with rare and unusual dolls. What better place to hide? No one would suspect what was behind those burning eyes of hers. I myself have purchased dolls for my little granddaughter from her. We must go there immediately. We have no time to lose. This is the place. Let's go. Right. It's past two. There's no one on the streets. Oh, it's a better. Try the door. It's open. Probably waiting in the rear of the shop. 
was a creature she sent out. Well, let's go in. As quietly as possible. We must catch her by surprise. All right. There's a light coming from beneath that door back there. That is where we must go. Listen. It is the dance of the devil dies. The door is ajar. They're in there. I can see them. Yes, so do I. Be quiet. And soon, my children, you will be joined by two others. And then? No one can harm you. But when the new doll returns, he will bring with him what I need for the spell of the dancers. We must take her now. And they will join you in the dance of, of the devil doll. No! What are you doing here? We've come to stop you. Look out, folks! We have the dance! So have I! She is dead. She will cause no more harm. It seems strange to see those little creatures on the floor. All of them so quiet and still. And just a short while ago. They were participating in the dance of the devil dolls. Yes. Do not feel pity for them, Mr. Hunter. The dolls did not really live. They were a creation of evil, sparked by the malevolence of the old woman. When she died, they died with her. Perhaps the humans they resembled will rest quietly now. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Less than a minute ago, on dry land, 
two hundred yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Night the Fog Came. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Night the Fog Came. If the theory of evolution is correct, then there is a connection between the minute organisms which are found to be living in water and life as we know it today. But what connection with us did those things have which came from out of the fog? What connection with human life did those horrible creatures who came from the depths have... And what is their purpose? Why did they suddenly appear and destroy and vanish as suddenly as they had come? I shall tell you as much as I know about it. Listen to the tale of The Night the Fog Came. The first inkling of their existence came to us as we were going through some routine research. I dropped over to the lab to see how. Harold Enroth was perhaps one of the foremost men in his field. Our friendship stretched back for many years. I'd been away for a while, and so I dropped in at the lab to see him one morning. Jeff, you old dog, you're a sight for sore eyes. How are things going, Al? Fine, couldn't be better. How'd you like your vacation? I can't wait till next year. I hated to come back. You know, Jeff, I'm glad you dropped in. I, I have a little problem. Oh? What is it, money? No, not that. Here, I'll show you. Pull those blinds, will you? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I have a specimen here on the slide. I want you to take a look at it. Go ahead. Turn the projector on. All right. There. What do you think of that? Hmm. I don't know. It looks like some form of water life. But I don't think I've ever seen it before. This has been enlarged a hundred times. There's no use trying to recognize what it is. It's a form of water life completely unknown to us. A new form of life. Where did you get this? It's a specimen of water one of our field researchers took from the westernmost tip of Lake Superior, somewhere near the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. Have you contacted anyone else about it? No. Why not? Well, it's... Come on, come on. Don't try to avoid telling me how we know each other too well for that. All right, all right. Listen to me, Jeff. All right? Everything I say is fact. I've conducted countless tests to discover what I do know about this form of life. That thing is able to reproduce itself. A hydra type? Possibly. That's beside the point right now. What's more important, all trace of the other organisms organisms in that drop of water has disappeared. Are you serious? Of course I am. And another thing, there was a little mist hovering above what was left of the water. A, a mist? That's what I call it. Something like fog. Why, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. I know that when the water evaporated, it should have been dispersed into the air. Eventually it was, but not for several hours. Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. I still can't. Here, I'll show you. We have a little of the water left. It's over here in this jar. You can see for yourself. Well, it looks just like ordinary water. I know it does. But believe me when I say it isn't. Now, it'll take just about three minutes. Do you see what's happening? I can't believe my eyes. See that little cloud of misty vapor beginning to form like fog? Yes. What causes it? I wish I knew. Our field men say the conditions up there are getting to be unbearable. The whole area for a hundred square miles is almost covered completely by this fog. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going up there myself. Jeff, if I send for you, will you join me? Of course. I may need you. I may need everyone I can get. It's begun to prey on my mind, Jeff. Somehow I think there's something in back of this. Something the likes of which the world has never seen. Something evil. <laughs> went up there the afternoon of the morning I had seen him. At first he wrote that the reports had been exaggerated. Then he discovered that all traces of the new form of life had disappeared. He decided to return. I was quite glad to get that letter from Hal. Before he had gone up there, he had been quite worried. The only thing I couldn't understand was what had become of the new water life form. The day before he was to return to the city... Hello? Jeff, this is Hal. Where are you? I thought you... I had them put me through direct to you. Jeff, I need your assistance. What's the matter? I've already called Arnold Simpson and Jack Rackle. They've agreed to come. I need you too, Jeff. Just as soon as you can possibly make it. Don't worry, Hal. I'll be there. Remember, 
there as soon as you can possibly make it. I knew Arnold Simpson, and he and I went up together. The train left Chicago and headed north, and then slightly west over Illinois and Wisconsin. Simpson and I talked it over on our way up there. Hal talked to you before he left, didn't he, Arnold? Yes, he did. I never had enough time to get up to his lab so he could show me what it was, but his words were description enough. Frankly, I'm worried. In what way? Jeff, why should a new form of water life suddenly appear? Why should it destroy everything with which it comes into contact? And why should the mist or the fog appear to be so dense and heavy? I don't know. That's just the trouble we don't know. Where has this form of life been, or did it just develop? What's its reason for being here? Perhaps we'll find the answers to those questions when we get there, Arnold. Perhaps. But I'm convinced of this much, Jeff. Whatever it is, whatever that fog is hiding, poses a new problem for us. A problem which may be unsolvable. And which could very well destroy the human race. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Night the Fog Came. Simpson seemed disinclined to talk, so we spent the remainder of the trip in silence, both of us lost in our thoughts. We arrived at the town and then hired a car to take us to the little village, where we would find Hal Enrum. The closer we came to our final destination, the darker the sky became, and the air was heavy with a mist which was both damp and clammy. It was an old rickety car, and the roads were little better than the ground on either side of it. The car stopped a few hundred feet from our destination. You gotta walk the rest of the way. You said you'd drive us all Look, away. mister, I come farther than I was going to in the first place. I ain't no mood to go into the woods up there. If you're gonna go, then you walk in. Jeff, can't you do something? I don't think so. Here's your pay. Thanks. Let's go, Arnold. It could be worse, Arnold. I suppose so. He seemed genuinely afraid. Aren't you? A little. Hey, we must be pretty close to the lake. I've never seen the fog this thick. It's unnatural. Eventually, we made it up to the house. Hal was there waiting for us and showed us where we would sleep. Through the window, I could see that the fog seemed to be getting thicker. That's a neary, lonely sound. You get used to it after you've been here for a while. Hal, you wrote me that this fog, the new form of life, had disappeared. It had. But two days ago, it suddenly reappeared. And with it, the fog returned. Then there must be a connection between the two. Yes, but what? I haven't any idea. Look, I have to go down to the village for some food. We don't have enough here to feed four of us. Will you come with me, Jeff? Certainly. I'll be right back, Arnold. It's only about a mile away near the lake. Go ahead. That trip would be tired. I think I'll take a nap. The house in which we were staying was on a high level of ground which tapered off on the side facing the lake. It was only three in the afternoon, but it looked almost as dark as late evening. And there was something about that cloudy mist. It was cold and clammy and smelled strongly of the lake. I don't see how you were able to stand it up here by yourself. Well, I had a lot of things to interest me. I was all ready to meet you at the station, but then when I got your call, I didn't know what to think. I wish I could understand this, Jeff. The fog disappeared when the water life disappeared. When signs of this strange new form of life showed again, the fog came back. Why? Maybe we can find the answer to that. And I hope so. Actually, the sound of that fog horn does get on your nerves. Yes, I can imagine it would. You know, if this were a clear day, you could see the village from here. Oh, actually, it's just a tiny resort town for fishermen and hunters. And it's located right on the westernmost tip of the lake. Imagine it must... Ah, help it! Help it! Ah! It came from our right. We'd better take a look. Come on. We're getting close to the lake. It's only this fog. Wait a minute. There. Right there. Let's take a look. I hope he's all right. All right. Roll him over. Okay. He's dead. I know. But do you realize how he died? What do you mean? Look at him closer, Hal. His clothes aren't wet. 
Even his hair isn't wet. But look at the water trickling from his mouth. This man died less than a minute ago on dry land, 200 yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. That's not possible. Are you sure he drowned? There must be a doctor down at the village. Let's take him down there and see what the doctor says. Only I'm sure he'll agree with me. Together, we carried the man down to the village. Luckily for us, he was a slight build, not too heavy. It took us almost half an hour to get him down there. When we finally did arrive, it took another few minutes to locate the doctor. What do you think, Doctor? You're getting them out of here. All right. Will you uh, please wait outside? The doctor can't work with you in here. He's just like all the others, any doc. Please wait outside. Thank what, you. What did he mean by he's just like all the others, Doctor? Just what he said. Ever since this fog has settled down again, five people have died. All in the same way? Yes. You, you mean by drowning? That's right. I can't understand how this man we found could die by drowning when he wasn't in the water. No, he reached him about a minute after he screamed. How could he drown? Professor Enroth, I've been asking myself that same question about all the others. I've been almost half insane these past two days trying to find the solution. <laughs> Dr. Craig, this fog, has it always been like this in the area? No, not until about two months ago. Which coincides with the time we first discovered that new form of water life. What did you say? Uh, nothing, Doctor. We're doing a little research work up here, that's all. This keeps up. I'm afraid of what might happen. I've never seen anything like it before. The fog, those deaths, how can they be explained? We don't know, Doctor. We just don't know. When we got back to the house, we discovered that Simpson had indeed taken a nap. Our arrival must have awakened him, for as we entered, he came slowly down the stairs from the second floor. Need any help? No, we can manage, but come out to the kitchen with us. What's the matter with you two? We found a dead man on our way to the village. Are you serious? Let's set those bags on the table. All right. No, I'm not joking, Arnold. We heard a scream. It took us about a minute to get to him. He was dead when we got there. A knife? Drowned. What? On dry land. 200 yards from the lake. You must be insane. No, it's the truth, Arnold. And there have been four other deaths just like it. When did they happen? In the last two days. Since the fog reappeared. That's right. Then there is a definite connection between this fog and the new life form you've discovered, Hell. That's right. But what's the connection? We'd gotten back to the house about six o'clock. It was about seven that it happened. Simpson said he was going outside for a minute. He opened the door. I just want to get outside for a minute. Good heavens. What's wrong? Take a look. It's the fog. It's so thick. I've never seen anything like that before. Shut the door. Some of it's getting inside. It's moving along the floor. Just Shut just the like... door. Did you see it? Yes. The fog. Just like it was alive. Moving like, like a living thing. Creeping along the floor. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Night the Fog Came. When Simpson had opened the door, the fog crept into the house in little wisps that curled and snaked this way and that. It looked like a thing alive. You saw it, didn't you, Hell? Yes, I saw it. What does it mean? I'm afraid of what it means. You mean you... You know? I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid I'm not. It's just possible that this form of life is developed from something that was present in the water all the time. The great brute animals ruled the world before man appeared and then were destroyed. Eventually, mankind wrested the supremacy of the earth from the other animal and plant life. Perhaps the cycle is to continue. Perhaps, after man, this new form of life. <laughs> As the minutes passed by, we noticed that little slips of the fog began inching their way through every opening of the house. It was Simpson who pointed down at the bottom of the door and first brought it to our attention. We began to plug up all the openings in the house. At first, we did it slowly, but as time passed, we worked faster and more feverishly. No matter how tired we became, we had to finish the job or the fog might claim the house, too. It was too quiet. 
The only thing we heard was the distant, monotonous call of the foghorn. And then Hal broke the silence. Do you know why this fog is so thick? I wish I did. This might be insane, but it has to be the answer. That fog is carrying moisture, a lot of it, perhaps enough to also carry this new form of life. To move it from place to place, to spread it even farther. To kill everything which stands in its way. That might be it. It is. I'm sure it is. Well, in that case, what happened to break it up the first time? And that's the solution to the problem. I don't know what it is, but it did break it up the first time. It drove it back, down to the depths from where it came. That's why there was no sign of it in the water. Ah! It came from right outside the house. Racco. He said he was going to arrive this evening. You better take a look. Uh, bring the flashlight. Right. Let's go. That light can carry more than a few feet. It's so wet out here. Over there, look. Little pinpoints of light dancing up and down, all clustered together. That must be it. Come on. It's spreading out. All right, look. There, on the ground. It's Racco. The same way. The same way as the other one. Specks of dancing luminescence had withdrawn from Rakow's body, but now we noticed that there seemed to be more of them. We carried the body back to the house. We'd forgotten to close the door behind us, and some of the fog had gotten inside. It wasn't too bad, however, and by little it began to disperse. Look out that window. Yes, I see them. Gathering together with a whole mass, getting larger and larger all the time, separating like the Hydra. It must be destroyed. Yes, but how? They created the fog. That must be the only way they can travel on land. They must have a basic water carrier. Have you realized what this means? What are you getting at? The area this fog now covers is a hundred square miles. Every animal in this area may lose its life. And then what happens? They divide again and again and again. And the area of the fog keeps getting larger all the time. If it isn't stopped now, while we still have a chance, it may never be stopped. And I ask you the same question, Simpson. How? I don't know. Someone's outside. Let him in quickly. They're moving towards the house. Oh, thank goodness. I didn't think I'd make it. It's a miracle that you did. Sit down, Doctor. Thank you. I was out for a call on my way back to town. I noticed how thick the fog was. And then I noticed the animals lying dead in the forest. The smell of their death was in the air. I continued on towards the town. And then I saw the bodies lying just where they had fallen. The whole town seemed to be covered by a strange luminescent mass, which in some manner moved. I was afraid. Then I thought of you people in this house, and I got here as soon as I could. I don't know how long we'll be able to withstand them, Doctor. I'm sure the townspeople are dead now. In fact, almost every living creature in the area must be dead. But what is it? What caused it? If we get out of this alive, Doctor, we'll tell you. Look outside. It must have split again. It's twice the size it was. What are we going to do? Look under the doorway. They're getting through. Lock it up. Use some newspaper. Close anything. We've got to stop it. Constant opening and closing of the door. Loosen the other things we have down there. I think that would do. Look. The things that did get in. First you see their light and then they're gone. What happens to them? Perhaps we can't see them. Or perhaps they die. Now, wait a minute. Your first letters to me mentioned the fact that the mist had been dispersed. What caused it? I don't know. Doctor, you're a native of these parts. Yes. I want you to tell me about anything unusual which happened that day. Well, I don't remember anything about that day particularly. I, I remember I was quite pleased to see that the fog had lifted. It was a beautiful day. Unseasonably warm. In fact, the, the sun was quite hot. Heat. I wonder if... If what, yet? These things, these hydra-type creatures must die in the heat. This house is quite warm. The day the fog was dispersed was warm with a bright sun. Perhaps that's the answer. Doctor, is there any fire break around this area? Well, there was one cut through the trees several years ago. Yes. In case of a fire, a bad one in the heavy timberlands, everyone was instructed to get into this area. In other words, there's a complete fire break around this entire area. Yes. It comprises about 150 square miles. And that's it. It's the only chance we have. We'll burn out this area and hope it drives them back. There's some oil downstairs. Get it. We'll start the fire here and hope it sets fire to the trees surrounding this house. Be right back. We'll have to make a run for it once this place is on fire. We may not come out of this alive, but we can try. The last Good. Everybody knows what... You'd better light it. Those things outside, they're going to get in. Each man will carry a torch. Yes. And I'd light your torches. All right. And then set fire to this house. All right. right. Lighting mine. All right. And yours, huh? All right. One more. All right. Uh, uh, under the door. They're pouring in under the door. Set the house on fire. Let's get out of here. No matter what happens, we hold those torches. They're afraid of fire. All right. Make a run for it.
The fire caught hold and the entire area was burned out. A week later, the smoke had cleared and the fire was out. There was no sign of the fog which had meant death to so many things. I had caught a glimpse of the doctor. He had dropped his torch and it had gone out. He was immediately engulfed in those luminescent killers. I'm going back up there with Enroth and Simpson. Though there is now no trace of those things in the water, still we know they lurk somewhere waiting for their moment. We must destroy them once and for all before that moment arrives. <laughs> Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.